uh, uh, so now we will receive uh, Kasun Indarisi, Senior Director at uh, WSO2, who will talk us uh, talk with us about gRPC up and running. Hi, Kasun. How are you? Can Hi, you Mehdi. Can you share your screen? And the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Mehdi. Oh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for attending the session. And I hope you are enjoying the conference. So in this session, I'm going to cover some of the key microservices communication patterns that you can build with uh, gRPC and also how these communication patterns uh, fit in the API management land landscape. So uh, before I begin a brief introduction about myself, uh, I'm currently working as a, a product manager and a, a senior director at WS2. And I've been working in the enterprise integration, API management, and microservices domain for last uh, several years. And uh, in the process, I also authored a couple of books, uh, one on gRPC and one on microservices. Also, I closely work with the uh, API management and uh, microservices communities in the uh, Bay Area. So that's about me. So uh, before I uh, go into the details of these communication patterns, let me give you a quick overview of gRPC. I'm sure most of you are, uh, you have heard of gRPC or maybe you are using gRPC in production even, but uh, let me give you a quick overview of the protocol and how it works. So as you know, when you are building distributed applications, when you are designing applications using microservices or any other a similar architecture, you are designing them as distributed applications. So when you have to have some uh, interconnectivity between these applications, you have to use different inter-process communication technologies. So gRPC is one such technology where you can invoke a remote uh, application as easy as making a local function call. So uh, if you're from uh, uh, if you're from RPC background, if you're familiar with Coba or any other similar technologies, this is the very same thing. So you have a, a remote uh, application, you generate code and you uh, invoke uh, that uh, stub or remote uh, method as easy as making a local function call. But the uh, the cool thing of GR cool thing with gRPC is you have all the state of our uh, technologies. Uh, built on on top of it, so where you have uh, where you you are using HTTP two for communication protocol buffers for serialization and so on. So uh, if we go into the details of the protocol and how it works, is as part of a uh, gRPC application, the very first thing that you would do is you'll you'll be building a uh, service definition. So you can call it an API definition if you prefer, but it's the contract. Uh, contract with all the business capabilities that you want to expose to your consumers. So once you have the service definition, then you can generate the service side or the client side code. Uh, so this is sort of a way to abstract out or hide all the details of the underlying communication so that uh, the service developer or the uh, client application developer can only focus on the uh, business logic of your application. So once you have the, uh, all your services and uh, client application developed, then you can communicate uh, communicate with each other using the uh, gRPC protocols. Uh, so underlying the uh, gRPC protocol, where we use uh, protocol buffers on top of HTTP2, so that is the serialization for format. So obviously, this is a binary protocol, which is uh, one of the main reasons for the high performance nature of uh, gRPC. And owing to the uh, language and framework agnostic uh, nature of the protocol, you can have your service built using one particular programming language, whereas your client can be built using a completely different programming language. Now, uh, let me give you a quick overview of the service definition as well. So as I said earlier, this is the place that you would give the uh, business contract of your uh, API or the service. So as part of the service definition, you'll uh, define set of remote methods, uh, the method that you want to expose over the network. So here I have two methods, add product and get product methods, and also the uh, types that I have used in my uh, method arguments or in return type. So this is a fully type safe uh, 
uh, service specification. So once you have the service definition, then uh, you can generate your server and client side code. So as uh, as part of the service definition, we ex use uh, protocol buffers to define the service with some extensions to support this uh, gRPC services concept. And uh, one reason for uh, using protocol buffers is that uh, it's a language agnostic, platform neutral, and extensible protocol, uh, which can serialize data efficiently, uh, basically marshalling and unmarshalling uh, data efficiently. So uh, once you have a uh, service definition in place, then you can uh, generate your service uh, or the client side code. So in the service side, what you would do is you'll generate the code uh, with all the abstractions uh, so that it will hide all the communication details that you have to deal with, uh, serialization to protocol buffers, dealing with HTTP2 and so on. But as, as a developer, what you get is a uh, couple of methods that you have to implement. Uh, this is where you implement your business logic. So this is a sample Go code. Uh, but uh, as part of the service development, this is all you have to deal with. And all the related uh, types and everything is generated for you from the underlying uh, framework or the plugin. So gRPC offers multiple plugins for various frameworks and programming languages. So all for almost every popular programming language, you can find plugins. So once you have the service up and running, uh, uh, in the sense, once you have the services business logic uh, uh, implemented, then you can, uh, you have to start a server, right? So server service contains the business logic and server is the place that you can expose to the external world. So once you have the uh, service, then you can start a gRPC server and register your service with uh, the gRPC server. So then uh, your gRPC service will be available over the network so that client applications can invoke it. So in the client side, again, very uh, same procedure. You use the service definition and generate the client side code. So from the client, uh, here we have a Java example. So from the client, uh, what you would do is you'll create a channel or a connection with the server. So as you can see here, you can have localhost and the port of the gRPC server. And using the client side stop, you can invoke any remote method that your GRP service offers. So you can see you are invoking all these rem remote methods as easy as making a local function call. So everything is, uh, every other detail is transparent for the developer. So I hope that gives you a, a quick overview of the GRPC protocol. And uh, let me quickly give you a uh give you some of the key advantages that grpc brings into the picture so obviously because of the use of protocol buffers and http2 it is a very efficient protocol compared to rest versus any other text-based protocols and and uh, also the uh, specification the service specification is a strict specification it is a mandatory specification and you have all the types well defined in the service specification. So that means uh, your services or client applications that you are building with uh, gRPC is fully type safe and uh, very easy to be shared with any external parties because you have the service contract already in place. And it's polyglot. You can use the same service definition and have multiple programming languages to build different part of your application. That means you have you can have Go for implementing your server side, uh, Java for implementing client side, and so. And also it offers duplex streaming. So unlike most of the other protocols, streaming is a first class uh, citizen of gRPC. So you can extend gRPC protocol to support various uh, complex use cases using stream. So I'll, I'll, re I'll uh, discuss some of the streaming use cases in detail in the upcoming slides. And obviously being part of the Cloud Native uh, Foundation, uh, so this is this offers uh, a wide range of ecosystem support as well. So, uh, so how you can use gRPC in practice? So, uh, so this is based on this overall architecture is based on common uh, or the pragmatic usage of gRPC in most of the current microservices deployment. 
So because of its high performance nature, it is used as the internal service communication protocol in most of the microservices uh, implementation. So as you can see, you have multiple uh, microservices communicating with each other using gRPC. And uh, uh, most of the services can be exposed as it is as a gRPC service. But uh, what we are seeing is most of them are exposed as REST or GraphQL services. That's OK, because, uh, because of the uh, high interoperability of those two protocols and how commonly uh, you have built a lot of REST and uh, GraphQL services. And uh, and also it can be used with other messaging protocols. So obviously gRPC is most, most more or less a request response style uh, communication protocol, but it can be used alongside other communication protocols such as Kafka or any other messaging protocols. And often you can expose all these uh, microservices as APIs using the API gateway. So I'll discuss some of the aspects of gRPC services when you have to expose them as APIs using an API gateway uh, later in the session. So let's have a quick look at uh, how we can compare and contrast all these uh, main, com uh, all the common API protocols. So uh, if you look at, uh, let's compare this with uh, REST and GraphQL. So if you look at the protocol, gRPC is inherently built, up, built on top of HTTP2. And uh, it is it is only works with the binary protocol. And whereas the GraphQL and uh, REST works uh, as textual protocols. So the service definition, again, first class support for the service definition, similar to GraphQL. And also you can do code generation. Uh, in most cases, REST and open API uh, code generation is optional. So, uh, but uh, unlike uh, gRPC, uh, you, you have to use third party libraries. And also streaming and, uh, so one of the ma main weakness of gRPC is the less browser support. So unless if you are using uh, gRPC web, we don't have uh, proper browser support for gRPC yet. So that's one reason uh, it to be exposed as a REST service when you have to expose them outside. All right, so now let's go back to our uh, communication protocol discussion. So in this couple of slides, I'll uh, go through some of the key uh, communication patterns that you can build with gRPC. So the first one obviously is the simple RPC or the unary RPC, the very same use case that we explained earlier. So in this case, I have an order management service and I'm uh, invoking it remotely. Uh, the, the remote method is called get order with the order ID. So this is simple request and response, one uh, request and one response. The service uh, definition is quite straightforward. Here you have a RPC method, get order with uh, some uh, input value and a return type, uh, order as the return type. So uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, pattern, let's look at server streaming RPC. So this is a slightly complex version of the simple RPC. Here we have uh, one request going from client to the service, but you can see multiple responses are coming from uh, server to the client. So uh, here we have a user, uh, use case where you send a search order request with a query. And as the response, you get multiple responses. Right. So the key idea here is that uh, for single requests, you can receive multiple order responses. So in the service definition, uh, you specify uh, that uh, here I'm invoking a remote, here I'm specifying a remote method search order, but my return type contains uh, not just a single order, but stream of orders. So that is how you have to uh, uh, specify at the service level. And when service is done with sending all the responses back to the client, you can uh, just mark the end of the stream. And if you are more into code level, then you can see uh, at the service side, you can do multiple sends using the same stream. And when you are done with uh, sending all the responses, you can just return a nil in the this Go code. So same applies for the client side. You can start receiving multiple responses. 
so as you can see uh, from the use case itself it's a very common uh, use case uh, which will be a little hard to build with conventional uh, communication protocols so the client side streaming is the opposite of server side streaming where you send multiple requests as a stream to the service and you can receive one single response so uh, you can easily understand the service definition here as well so uh, here i have uh, defined an rpc method update orders with multiple orders a stream of orders and i'm getting a single response back as the return type so one thing to understand here is that uh, server can respond uh, uh, so it can either wait till it receives the end of the stream or it can uh, it can send the response when it uh, receives maybe a couple of requests when it satisfies uh, the business use case it can immediately send the response rather waiting till the end of end of the stream so i'm not going into the details of the code uh, it's you can uh, it's very straightforward and you can easily understand them and then we have a combination of the two bidirectional streaming rpc so uh, use case is slightly complex here. So as you can see uh, here, we are sending a process order request with uh, multiple orders and the order management service is supposed to send us a ship, uh, send us a stream of shipments. So we process all these orders and organize them into shipments. So that's a very uh, common use case. And uh, so in, as the input type here, we have a stream of uh, uh string values as order ids and as the return type also we have a stream of combined shipment so uh, again the business logic may be a little complex because the use case is uh, slightly, slightly complex but uh, again uh, the concept is very same you just generate uh, uh, just create a service definition with two streams input and output and you can build your business logic around it all right, so those are the two, uh, four main communication patterns that you can leverage when you're building microservices with gRPC. And there are a set of uh, supporting communication patterns. So, uh, so gRPC interceptors is one of the very common concept where you have to, where you can implement a, a common business logic uh, that you can execute uh, either before or after the execution of your remote function call. So uh, interceptors can be plugged at uh, either service side or the client side. So prior to receiving a, a RPC uh, message, you can invoke the inter interceptor logic and maybe you can do some business logic or some commodity, business, commodity logic there. And also there are multiple interceptor types available. Uh, so you have uh, unary interceptors for simple RPC and uh, streaming interceptors to intercept each and every message that are part of the stream. So interceptors are commonly used for login authentication and matrix uh, implementations of uh, gRPC, but you can use it for any business use case as well. So another concept uh, that is commonly used is deadlines. Uh, as the name implies, a deadline is a absolute uh, uh, time that you can specify from the grpc client side so in in most microservices you can see multiple microservices being a part of a single microservices invocation so from the client side you can uh, specify a particular deadline value and uh, when that deadline expires uh, there will be a error or a error return from this uh, invocation so that you can gracefully handle deadline exceeded uh, error at your client side. So it's a very commonly used concept. So then uh, metadata is another uh, commonly used uh, concept where you can pass uh, some uh, data from client to server or server to client. So these are more or less uh, not related to the business logic. So if the uh, data is related to the business logic of the service. It should be part of the remote method invocation. But if this is not part of the business logic, then you can use gRPC metadata. So often uh, we use uh, gRPC header concept to pass this metadata, and we denote this metadata in the form of key value pairs. So uh, one of the main examples that we can uh, use is security headers of gRPC uses metadata. 
Then multiplexing, it's a, it may be not directly related to the microservices architecture, but it's a way that you can host two similar services in the same server runtime. So as we have seen earlier, so you can start a gRPC server and you can register multiple service in instances. So if they are in the same category or similar type, you can host uh, uh, one, uh, one single server that can uh, host two different services. Then cancellation, uh, this is commonly used when you use streaming in most cases. So cancellation is a way that you can uh, notify the other party that you have terminated the RPC. So in uh, most of the gRPC streaming cases, both sides can independently determine when to terminate the connection. So when one party terminate the uh, RPC, uh, uh, when one party terminates the RPC, then uh, the other party can determine by checking the uh, connection or the channel context to see whether the connect context is already cancelled. So uh, it is quite uh, useful in certain use cases as well. All right, so we talk a lot about all the most commonly used uh, gRPC communication patterns. And let now let's see how we can use them in the context of API management. So suppose you are exposing a gRPC service as it is as a managed API. So there are two things that you can do. So you can do uh, API management at the remote method level, uh, as well as uh, uh, the service level itself. So you can have product management service and you can do API management for the entire product management service or uh, more granular API management for each and every method for add, add product or get product, you can individually manage them. And various authentication, authorization and uh, rate limiting uh, implementations uh, can be built on top of the API gateway uh, of the uh, of the gRPC service that you are going to use. And versioning is another important con concept in this context because you can use, uh, you can have multiple versions of the same gRPC service and you can expose them via the gateway. And uh, so in this case, uh, you can leverage protocol buffers uh, uh, packaging versioning. Uh, so using, using protocol buffer packaging, you can have multiple versions of the same gRPC service and expose them via the gateway. And also one other important thing is uh, as part of the gRPC service, you get a very uh, strict and very rich uh, API definition. And also you can augment that definition with multiple other extensions. So for example, you want to, suppose you want to expose uh, rate limiting details as part of your API service, uh, API definition then using protocol buffer extensions, you can embed those uh, details as part of the service definition. So virtually you are converting your gRPC service definition to a gRPC API definition, where you have all the API management concepts uh, in that definition as well. Now, in, in certain use cases, you may have to bridge, you may have to expose gRPC services uh, as, a, uh, as an open API. So uh, gRPC ecosystem project supports uh, a concept called gRPC gateway, where you can generate a, a, a reverse proxy automatically for the service definition of the gRPC. So this is acting as a sort of a protocol converter. The inbound is open API or REST uh, and outbound is gRPC. So this is, I guess this is available for Go language. So you can use it if you are using Go. So with that, I would like to conclude the session. So I hope it gives you a good understanding of uh, gRPC patterns and how you can use them in the context of API management. So there are multiple other patterns and more details and examples uh, available in the book, as well as uh, have shared uh, the source code repository where you can try out most of these patterns. And also a lot of information available in the gRPC.io site as well. So also as part of our company, we also uh, host a booth in uh, API Data Interface Conference. So feel free to visit us and discuss any further details and how we cater these uh, needs in our WSG platform as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Kasun. Thank you very much. Maybe last 
uh, one quick question before like uh, is um uh, yeah what's the main mistake people do implementing grpc yeah so i think uh, one main mistake uh, mehdi is uh, uh use try to use it for all the services all the services so i think uh, uh, if i go back to the uh, slide that i had uh, all these different protocols so uh, you cannot use grpc for all the different types of services uh, especially if you are hosting this as an external service but your client applications are more or less web applications uh, that cannot directly migrate to uh, this protocol so uh, so that's one one reason so i think you have to be pragmatic and select the best uh, communication protocol for the right uh, service that you have to export so that's a one common mistake and uh, also uh, most organizations are not used to be this kind of a strict type or strict service uh, prescriptive service uh, interface definition so they are not used to uh, that kind of a development life cycle so i think if you are transforming into grpc you need to be strictly adhere to the service first or api first uh, strategy uh, so that's another common thing that we can see yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kasun. Uh, thank you very much for being part of EPI Days. Uh, we also made a podcast about GRPC and running. Uh, you can find on EPI Days uh, website. Thank you, uh, Kasun. 